Welcome to Higher Edification, a podcast featuring college presidents and other education leaders talking about the state of higher education, as well as the challenges and opportunities we face. Higher Edification is a production of ACUP, the Association of Independent Colleges and Universities of Pennsylvania and Misericordia University. I'm your host, Dan Myers, president of Misericordia University in Dallas, Pennsylvania, also known as President Dan on TikTok. Today, I'm joined by Bob Uliano, the president of Gettysburg College. Bob, there's a lot we could talk about today, but I wanted to jump into a topic that I've been thinking about a lot, and I bet you have too, and that's kind of what's the value of the liberal arts education these days and and what is the perception of it and you know you know how do we help people understand the value of what we do at schools like ours boy dan you started with the easy question first I yeah, yeah that's right um, put you right on the spot bob <laughs> so just yesterday an article crossed my desk that i think speaks very much to one of the themes i've been sounding here and that was yet another survey of CEOs about the impact of artificial intelligence. And this wow. survey said that about 40% of existing jobs are gonna be rendered obsolete um, in the next several years by virtue of the impact of artificial intelligence on the way we live and the way we work. So that asks, that causes me to ask the question then, what should we be doing to make sure that we're preparing students for that world? And Dan, my answer, and I suspect it's very much like yours, that the people who are going to succeed in the world ahead, that's going to be as disrupted as it is, will be the people who can do what we seek to make sure our graduates can do every day. Think across disciplines effectively, lead organizations by virtue of effective communication skills, harnessing the power of diversity, communication, adaptability, resiliency. The very things that we seek to make sure students get by virtue of this broad education that we provide, is exactly what I think the world's going to need prospectively. But more importantly, it's not what I think. Ask employers. Employers are looking for the very skills that we're seeking to produce. So I think we're doing the right thing. But you asked a slightly different question that I think we should explore, and that is, how do we get it heard? Yeah. And that's a much more complicated endeavor. I'd be curious about how you've been thinking about that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, tough, uh, it's a tough sell right now because people are so focused on – uh, what's that first job going to pay, right? And that's the primary metric that the government is using even to, to determine uh, who's being successful and who's not amongst colleges and universities. It's really become uh, I, something that uh, of, uh, I would say, you know, um, unhealthy focus is that first piece. Um, you know, but having conversations like these, we hope, you know, people can hear uh, some of these uh, is one way of trying to get the word out a little bit. But, you know, it'd be nice if we could get some of these folks, these CEOs. I mean, I, I do this. I've been doing this exercise for years where when I run into somebody who's a successful CEO or COO of one of these big companies and I ask them what were the most important educational experiences they had as undergraduates. And they always say something from their liberal arts curriculum or from their core, you know, and, and it's exactly these kind of skills you're talking about. Maybe we need to recruit more of those people to start sounding that trumpet for us. I mean, I do think we have to begin to be very, um, we have to create the narratives that people can understand. You know, our species fundamentally believes in storytelling, the, mm -hmm. the power of narratives. I think we need to give examples, not just data, but examples, real life examples of the way it has an impact. And there are many examples out there. That said, I don't think the data is irrelevant. One of the things I say to our prospective students is, I'm not just worried about your first job. I'm worried about your second job. I'm worried about the jobs that haven't even been conceptualized yet. Georgetown did a study not all that long ago, Dan, where it looked about looked at the ROI, a 40-year return on investment of a liberal arts education. Gettysburg College was in the top 1%. And again, it's not because the first job is the job that's going to land you that. It's because we are preparing you, as are you, as are liberal arts schools, for a lifetime of engagement, professional development, leadership, innovation, creativity. That's what we do. By the way, we shouldn't lose sight of the other aspect of what we do, which is also making sure people can lead consequential lives, however they define it, right? So it's not just professional success. It's also uh, a sense of making making the best out of this gift we're given of a lifetime on the planet. Yeah, and, and, and I think there's a lot of data out there that demonstrates that people 
actually do that, right? They've, they're more likely to take on leadership roles in their community, and, and certainly at their job they are, but but also, you know, they're more likely to be philanthropic, and, you know, there's all kinds of uh, effects personally in terms of their health and their well-being and their ability to be a good uh, family member and things like that, but also mm -hmm. for the community around them, the kinds of skills that we're talking about to to think and read and be critical and to, you know, understand a complex world, those affect all of those different aspects of life and how we end up living a life of meaning. I, I agree with that. Now, obviously, we have the challenge, I think, in a hyperpolarized environment of getting that message heard, um, because we're at a moment where I think there, there are fair critiques of American higher education. Um, that we need to take seriously. But there are also broader critiques of American higher education that makes it a little bit harder for people to necessarily immediately hear the message that we're trying to send. And I think we own some of that again, Dan, um, uh, in the way we talk about what we do. For some of us, our price point, there are things that we need to be more um, conscious about. But I also think there are some headwinds that are a little bit beyond our control that we also need to be cognizant of. Yeah. Well, well, maybe we talk a little bit about some of those things that you think are fair critiques, and and maybe we might brainstorm a little bit about what to do about some of those. Um, um, I'm wondering which ones. Uh, you know, there's a lot in the environment out there right now, of course. Um, and so I'm I'm curious what you think are some of the fair things, and you know, what you think we might do as an industry, but maybe some of the things you're doing at your college to address some of that as well. Well, one of them is the uh, one of them is cost, just generally, at least perceived cost, right? Mm -hmm. Where the top line price of many institutions is beyond what people can afford, right? Uh, that doesn't mean the actual cost of that uh, is necessarily the case, but we need to be cognizant of the reality that the sticker price of American higher education has risen more in the last twenty years than any other industry other than healthcare. And so if you're the average American seeing wage stagnation, not seeing their wages in real terms rise, and you look at the cost of higher education, sometimes you think it's beyond your reach. Mm -hmm. And we need to recognize that, right? Yeah. It has a real life impact on our on an ability uh, of people to conceptualize the path that we offer. But I also think, and maybe this isn't a perceptual, this is a perceptual issue more than it is um, um, a concrete one. It goes back to what we were talking about a moment ago, and that is, are we clear that we are producing skills that will have enduring impact for our graduates, right? I think for too long, the educations we provide have been seen as a luxury, but they're not a luxury, they're a necessity. And we haven't done an effective job of actually bridging that misunderstanding by demonstrating, by being purposeful even in the way we structure our programs to make sure that there are hands-on opportunities, to make sure that the outcomes are demonstrable in terms of the skills that we profess we're seeking to ensure that our students graduate with. We're being quite purposeful about that at Gettysburg um, in the way that we are integrating our curriculum and our co-curriculum, making sure that what our students are learning, they're applying, being purposeful and giving them teams that will make sure that they are getting the most out of their experience here so when they sit across the table from one of those employers, they are able to not just describe what they did, but why it matters and how it translates into the very skills that an employer needs. We can be better at, at, at charting out that course for our students than we have been. I think we've assumed students will figure it out on their own. That's not necessarily fair. Yeah, no, that's right. I mean, I think there's a lot of opportunities for us to provide more guidance, not just classroom education, but guidance in, in these different things. Is there is there a specific uh, example? You said, you know, example storytelling helps. Is there, uh, can you tell me a story about a major or something where you've, uh, you know, had your faculty have purposely done some development along the lines that you were just talking uh, about that might uh, make this seem a little more concrete to folks who are listening? Well, we have, uh, in the sciences, as you would expect, um, there's a lot of hands-on opportunity. One of the things that we have developed here is a summer institute that's cross-disciplinary, where not only are students working in our faculty's labs uh, across the sciences, but then they come together uh, across the disciplines. So the physics person working in the physics lab is sitting next to the person working in the biology lab, is sitting next to the person working in the chemistry lab, and they end up talking about what they're doing and forcing a broader interdisciplinary understanding. 
That's one example. Different example, perhaps more, more on point, is we have something called the Eisenhower Institute here, uh, right. which is located in Washington. And it's designed to make sure that what our students are learning in the classroom, they also have the opportunity to apply in Washington, which is only 80 miles away from where I sit. Um, and so there's a purposeful integration between the classroom experience and what our students can do in Washington, whether they're working on Capitol Hill, whether they are working for a not-for-profit, or whether they're working in industry. And so that degree of integration and the communication from the faculty to the co-curricular side is something we are being very purposeful about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, those kind of experiences are incredible, especially if they're, as you say, purposeful and that there's this opportunity when you're out on the site to be using what you got in the classroom and then the other way around too, where you are taking what you've experienced out in this real world site and you're bringing it back to the academic side to inform your understanding of what's happening there. Uh, I was at American University before I came here and the internships you know, were in Washington. And so um, that opportunity was very robust there. And you could really see it when, when that connection was made well. Uh, wow. It, it, you know, it was sparks were flying for students. It was really great to see that kind of stuff. The other thing I think we're trying to encourage our students to do, Dan, um, it's not new, but again, I'm using the word purposeful, is just the power of reflection. That is to take a moment to pause. So we have a sophomore seminar that the PAM mm -hmm. faculty just passed that I think is ideally situated because they will have just completed one year of college. Oftentimes we do reflection as a senior, and that's great because it tells you what's coming next. But you do it as well as a sophomore, and mm -hmm. it's asking the question of what do you want out of the next two and a half or three years of your college experience? And it's asking our students to ask themselves, what's this education about? What do you want from it? What did you make of your first year? How do you make sure that you're going to get the very most out of the years that follow? And again, we've created these personal advising teams that will amplify that, that really gives our students a chance to be intentional and purposeful about this. But if we can leave our students with the power of introspection and reflection when they graduate, those tools will carry them a very, very long way in life. Wow, is, yeah, that is so powerful. I love that you're doing that in the sophomore year, Bob. I think that is absolutely terrific. And, you know, there there are this, these sort of moments that we think about in the college career um, where there's transitional something happening and there, there are danger points too for people dropping out or whatever. Uh, people often talk about the sophomore slump and things, but right after that first year, when you finally, you kind of figured college out, uh, what a great time to think about now, what do I want to do uh, next to prepare myself and how do I see myself differently after this first year of college? I think that's tremendous. Uh, and congratulations to you for doing that. And Dan, I think it's something that both your college and mine can do in a way that uh, our scale permits, right? Because we're small enough where the interaction that our students have with our faculty um, is distinctive, right? For the strength of the big R1s, it's harder to get that just because of the sheer size of what those institutions offer. But when we have that 10 to 1 student-faculty ratio, where the relationship you're establishing with the faculty member, I'll give you a small example. It's a bit of a digression, but I was at the uh, women's lacrosse game, the Centennial Conference Championship game. A mom came over to me and expressed how much she appreciated the full year experience of her daughter. Sitting directly in front of me was a chemistry faculty member who turned around and said, I had your daughter as a first year. She wasn't a chemistry major, but let me tell you all about my interactions with her. I thought that was so revealing of what's possible at a place like this, because mm -hmm. the faculty know our students, the faculty work with our students, they care about our students, and they're helping our students see the very best of themselves. Mm -hmm. I think our skill makes that possible. Yeah. Um, and particularly given the complexity of the world, I think that sort of experience has a special value to it right now. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, we, we we see that in different ways here, too. It's a very thickly connected community. and it's 
often very surprising to me. I'll be talking to somebody about a student or something and, and someone will say, oh, yeah, I had them in class or I have them in class or they know them from some context, you know, at the university. It's just really impressive. I mean, I went to Ohio State as an undergrad, so that was quite a different experience from this. And boy, uh, I've really come to appreciate it here. You mentioned personal advising teams before. Yes. Can you tell me what that structure is and how that operates. That sounds like something interesting. So it's something we started this year together with, I'll explain our guided pathways in a moment. Every student, when they walk in the door, starts with three advisors and they pick up a fourth after their first year. They will have, of course, their academic advisor. There's nothing novel about that. But we also now have a co-curricular advisor for precisely the point I was mentioning, Dan, that I want our students to spend as much time outside of the classroom on a range of co-curricular activities. Those should be learning experiences just as the classroom experiences are. And so our co-curricular advisors are helping to make sure that our students are learning from that. They will also have someone in our career center. So a career advisor from the day they walk in. Again, not because the 18 year old should know what they wanna do when they're your age and my age. I had no conception that I'd be sitting in this chair, trust me, when I was an 18 year old <laughs> going off to college. Right. Um, but begin to figure out what it means to decipher that world. And then after your sophomore year, a, an alumni advisor, um, someone who has gone through the Gettysburg experience, who has wow. navigated their way out into the world and can help translate how this works out there. And so this personal advising team uh, that will have some degree of integra integration ensures that students will get a broad range of views about how to take these precious four years and get the most out of it. That's that's great. And so and so that group of four people interact together with each other and with the student. Is that right? With the student. And there's a software that makes sure that what they're seeing is being seen by the others. And this is all part of a broader way in which we're amplifying the co-curricular experiences. We have these things called guided pathways that are a, a scaffolding on top of the co-curricular experiences to do precisely what I said a moment ago, to make sure that the students are learning from their experiences. So if you are the editor in chief of our student newspaper, where you can't hire people, you can't fire people, you don't pay them, how do you lead effectively? What does leadership mean? Uh, how can we help you not only become a better editor in chief, but more importantly, how do we help you understand the lessons from that experience and apply it to what happens next? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, that's, that, that sounds that sounds terrific. Uh, Bob, how it's long have you? Great, great national press so far. I've been really mm -hmm. pleased. Mm -hmm. The higher ed press. We're in our first semester of it, and so we are seeing the benefit, the early benefits of it, with our first year class. Yeah, we're going to have to send some people down and uh, check do. out what you're doing. Yeah, that's one of the great things about higher ed is that we do share with each other these uh, strategies and so forth. And, you know, we're always, in a sense, competitors for students, but we also we, we really value the mission of what we're trying to do. And so it, it's great to to share across and and to really be able to learn from one another about best practices and things. I, I've never thought this was a zero sum game. Uh, mm -hmm. The reality is that the sector as a whole, when people understand that what we do has real impact, then all of us benefit. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting that, you know, despite all the criticism and, you know, as you said, some of it's valid, some of it's not, I suppose, but the, uh, you know, the people who have experienced it with us, they place a very high value on it. Uh, very interesting to see, to see that now. Now, how long have you been a, a college president, Bob? This is beginning my fifth year. Fifth year. So you're, I mean, as college presidencies go these days, you're, you're, you're a wise and sage at this point in the fifth year. <laughs> now, what is the, I think the average statistic now, or the statistic is now 5.9 years is the average tenure of a college and university president. And Dan, I suspect you'll agree with me about this. That's really bad for higher education. That is a turnover every six years um, makes it really hard to really chart out a strategic direction makes it really hard to get to establish those relationships that make a profound difference, not only with your students, but with your faculty, with your alumni and the like. But, you know, if you've been watching what's happening out there in the world, these jobs have not gotten any easier given the multiple constituencies, given, again, that polarized political environment and just given all of the other challenges. But and I suspect you feel the same way. It also underscores the privilege we have in having these roles because they matter. They do matter. And, you know, you can you can look at almost any institution that's be, being successful and you can look at and see who's the president. And it makes a 
difference. And those that have stumbled, you can look and see uh, at the leadership there is uh, having problems, you know, so there's no question about it. And I, you know, that, that six year average, I think, uh, I think another study came out recently was even less than that. And, but that means if that's the average, that means half of them, if it's a normal distribution, half of them are less than that, right? So if six years isn't long enough, just think about the ones that are lasting three and four years. And then there's an interim person for a year. And then, you know, they do a search and they finally get somebody. And then that person lasts three years. Wow. I mean, you, you can't get much done. You can't get much traction in that amount of time because of all the relationship building and so forth. That's, that's part of the job. So and I just agree. the pivot from the pivot. So you have a strategic direction that you, you your fingerprints are on the strategic direction of your college. You turn mm -hmm. around and leave. The next president says, I want to do something different. And so that strategic direction ends up pa pausing. A new one has to get created. And meanwhile, the institution goes nowhere for a period of years. It's just not good for our students. It's not good for the institution. It's not good all around. Um, so you and I need to make a commitment to, to stay with it and recognize that what we do matters. I think it matters for our students, but it matters more broadly. I think these institutions play a profound role. Now, yeah. I say that in part because I sit at Gettysburg College, and if you think about any place in the world that thinks about the importance of um, education, about talking across difference, boy, the land I occupy um, sends a pretty powerful message about that. And I say this to our students all the time. You didn't go to just any student, any college. You went to a place with a special set of values about the importance of getting out there in the world and making a difference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, yeah, I think that's uh, very important to think about, Bob. And we, I think we were on a panel together just thinking about the value proposition of higher education last year. But uh, something you were talking about was, was this, how do we participate appropriately in this polarized world that we're in? And what role can colleges play? And I think that's been a special emphasis of yours because of what you just said. And I was wondering, you might uh, talk a little bit more about your thinking about that and maybe some things that you've done at Gettysburg, given its kind of special location in this space about that, you know, how, how, to, how to be a good, uh, you know, citizen and model this in terms of civic participation and so forth for students as a college or university? So part of it, Dan, is, I think it's important, right? It's a part of what we do as an educational institution is to understand the value of heterogeneous views, right? Um, we should not have a monolithic viewpoint in the world. We want to create a diverse student body on multiple dimensions to make sure that we see the world in its full complexity. But that requires purposefulness. So one of the things that we do that is distinctively Gettysburg, and I'm just going to digress a little bit, is we have the very second day our students are on campus, we do what we call the first year walk. And our students retrace the steps that our students and faculty took with Lincoln when he delivered the Gettysburg Address. And so we meet in the town set, we meet actually in the chapel. I make some comments to our students. We move into the town center where our students walked with Lincoln uh, to the National Cemetery. Then our member of our faculty or a member of the community reads the Gettysburg Address and reflects on it. And so from the very second day that our students are on campus, we are seeking to underscore to the very point I made a moment ago, you didn't just go to any college. You went to a place that has a special set of values that has resonance over what you're going to experience over the next four years. Then you add to it that Dwight Eisenhower retired to Gettysburg College, was on our board of trustees, wrote his memoirs for our admissions office, and he's arguably one of the most significant Americans, maybe one of the most significant world figures of his century. And he was all about the middle way. And so I mentioned earlier that we have the Eisenhower Institute. And so the Eisenhower Institute also seeks to create programming that teaches our students about how to talk across difference effectively. So last year, for example, we picked just about every provocative topic we could imagine. Let's talk about Second Amendment gun control rights. Let's talk about um, abortion and reproductive rights. And let's do it, though, in a structured way where students are obliged to express their position or a position, not necessarily their position, a position, listen to the opposing position and engage in a conversation, again, with adults in the room, helping them understand how most effectively to talk across difference. So you take the values of the place and you make sure that you're giving students multiple opportunities to apply it, and it's not perfect. 
but it's necessary because again, these are the folks who are gonna go out there and lead organizations. They're gonna be involved in their civic communities. What they learn here and what they model here will make a difference out there. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that that's a powerful experience. I mean, if you could just get people to actually engage with those who have, or at least are representing a different opinion, uh, that's the step one. And what we're doing right now, I think too much of is people are standing in their little uh, enclaves and they're throwing bombs at one another without really interacting. And when you can get them to actually talk, uh, that's where understanding can start to develop and where we can come to a middle ground that's going to be productive for us instead of polarized kind of digging in in a way that just isn't going to get anyone anywhere. You know. And Dan, don't you think we have a distinctive both responsibility, but also capacity to do that work? Because again, the very nature of what we believe in how education takes place is through exposure to the widest range of perspectives. Again, as I often say to my students, my job is not to tell you what to think, but I want to give you the tools to figure out what to think, but also the exposure to the breadth of perspectives so you can discern for yourself what matters. So it seems to me that we have the entree into the very necessity of these conversations because our students should understand that they will learn not simply by staying in their, their echo chamber, but by making sure that they are exposing themselves to other points of view. Yeah, I, I, I agree completely with you. And I think what we have, I, I feel that responsibility very strongly, and I have for a long time, especially you know, I've been in a few environments where we worked at it hard and we were successful, you know, at having some real useful interchange where there was some understanding. But the opportunity, sometimes I don't think we recognize that we have an opportunity to um, be a, a, you know, a, a town hall or I'm not sure what it is, but a place where people can gather to talk about ideas. And I think you you said a very, very important word in what you said, which was structure. And that's producing a structure under which this can happen and helping people understand that that's going to be there so they can volunteer to come into the environment. If they don't know what that structure is and it's just going to be a free fall, they're too scared that they're just going to be attacked by a group of people from the other side. Uh, we had that happen a lot at, when I was at Notre Dame when uh, certain topics would be on the docket for some kind of event. And we wanted to make sure there were balance. And sometimes we couldn't get the balance because one side appeared to be dominating the uh, event. And then the others didn't want to come because they were afraid of just being attacked, you know. And so that structure means so much. And it's something that we need to recognize more, I think. And Dan, you said earlier, you asked me a question earlier about some of the challenges that higher education has. And one of them is something you just alluded to. We are seen, I'm not sure fairly, as only permitting certain views to be expressed on campus, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's certainly one of the motifs out there right now about higher education. We're liberal, we're not really open to the widest range of views. So I think the other thing that we do by creating that structure is also rebut that, I think, again, it's not an accurate perception. We rebut mm -hmm. the proposition that we are that echo chamber that I think we're often painted as, because we're not, right? We really are trying to make sure that our students are exposed to the widest range of views. That is not being heard out there right now. And I think it ends mm -hmm. up having a negative effect in our attractiveness sometimes to the widest range of students. Yeah, I th yeah that's absolutely true. And, you know, and I think that, uh, you know, I think that, of course, you can find uh, certain places where, you know, it's, it's it's really strong one way or the other, really. I mean, it's not just on one end, it's on, on both yeah. ends. But I, I, most of us are not in that space. We're much more in the middle where we're trying to be, uh, do what you're saying, which is give people the tools, as not, not give them the opinion. We're trying to give them the tools to, to understand the world and to interrogate it in the, in the best way and you know, come to their own conclusions about things. That's, that's very, very important. I mean, I, I would say that if people can't uh, sort of uh, come to their own conclusions and feel strongly about them, given the tools that we give them, then we've somehow messed up. You know, we, we failed as institutions. That's our call is to, to equip people for that kind of thinking and that kind of participation in, in the rest of the world. So, uh, yeah, I, more. 
Yeah, I, I hope we can find ways of, of telling people that this is what we're about. And maybe your exampling uh, idea is is something we need to do, work more on. I mean, I think, you know, sometimes we suffer from exampling because people do exotic exampling. Like, well, they will say, uh, they'll find somebody who has $200,000 of student debt and, and act like that example right. is the norm when the norm is more like 30 something thousand dollars. That That's more what people have. Uh, in debt. Um, and, and so, and that happens in various ways, you know, where we find somebody who's uh, really out there and we act like they're representative of the group. And so we want to av avoid that, but finding examples where there's success in the middle, I think is uh, probably a very important strategy for us that we haven't done enough of. And I think there's also opportunity not to just do this institution by institution, right? Uh, but our two institutions should collaborate in ways to make sure that our students are experiencing each other in different ways, right? We have a strength in being in Pennsylvania that there are a lot of schools like us um, uh, in the Commonwealth. How do we work together more effectively? What opportunities can we give our students that they can't just get on our campus to really, again, broaden their perspectives? Because our schools are not exactly the same, right? Um, right. They, have, they have cultural differences as well. There are opportunities in that. Yeah, yeah, that's that's right. And so, you know, one of the, one of the things I, I have loved about being in Pennsylvania is this association right here, A Cup. Yeah, it's the association of of the independent, the private schools in uh, in Pennsylvania. And there's ninety some of us, uh, and it's a it's a very robust organization. Uh, and I think it it can do more of this kind of stuff as well, uh, given that basic strength of the organization. And I, I, I've just been so pleased to be a part of it and to think about some of the other opportunities that are in front of us. And so maybe that's something we get to talk about at our president's conference this year. Uh, Bob, you and I can uh, raise the flag and see what we can come up with. That would be a great thing to do. Happy to do it and couldn't agree more about ACA. Yeah. Well, Bob, uh, we're, I think we're getting close to the end of our time here. And we one thing I like to do on these uh, podcasts is you know, kind of turn us college presidents into real people. And I always ask about a few things that uh, uh, about people outside of their job and try to work it in. And I, we got so involved in our conversation, I didn't get to uh, talk to you about those things. But one of the things you said is you're an avid runner, and I am too. Maybe that's a common trait among presidents. I don't know. But tell me about your running a little bit. And how does that uh, fit in with this crazy life we have as presidents <laughs> uh, trying to do this job? So, Dan, two things I'll say about that. One is I need to have you come to Gettysburg because there is nothing more sacred than running the battlefield when the sun is rising in the morning, mm. particularly on the right day. If there's a little bit of mist over the battlefield and you're running through it, it is it is as solemn and as inspiring a moment as I've experienced in any run that I have ever done any place, anywhere with no exaggeration whatsoever. Um, so someday get you on campus, um, get you out there when the sun's coming over the horizon. It's powerful. So that's point one. Um, point two, oh, and for the listeners, I should note that my building is smack in the middle of day one of the Battle of Gettysburg, which was a three-day battle. So in about two seconds, we are off in the national park that is the protected battlefields that took mm. that reflect the three-day Battle of Gettysburg, which was the bloodiest battle in the history of American soil. So there, when I talk about solemnity and sacredness, it's in the context of not only what it meant to the American democracy, um, but the real sacrifices that were laid here uh, over that battle. But the second thing that it does, and I'm not sure my team appreciates the stand, you tell me if yours does, but I invariably end a run because my mind clears and I think about an issue, what's on my mind, and I come back with like 18 different suggestions of things we need to do. So I think my team would prefer that I exercise a little less than I do. That I don't know if that's true for you, but I think it yeah. is true. It does. It's very helpful. And I think it, it helps you maintain sanity and focus really in these moments. And I have another uh, thing I do every year too, which is a week completely off the grid, oh, wow. uh, no cell phone, nothing, go kayaking in the wilderness with my son. And, but I have a journal 
And I come back with way too many ideas <laughs> from that. So I know exactly what you're talking about. Uh, it, that mind clearing could really be powerful. I would love to come down and run. You know, one of the things when I run, sometimes I run cemeteries and uh, you know, I always wonder if people think it's disrespectful to run in cemeteries, but I don't at all. And I, I feel that power of respecting those folks. And, you know, you can see the flags from the veterans and things. And, you know, I, I, I always feel like I'm trying to honor them by, by being present there and thinking about what they what their lives were like and what they gave to their families and to their country and to everything uh, when I'm doing that kind of run. So I would love to do that with you. Someday. And we will find the occasion to pull that off. How's that? That would be great. I'll very much look forward to it. Thanks for joining us today. We've been speaking with Bob Giuliano, the president of Gettysburg College, and we hope you enjoyed this installment of Higher Edification, uh, brought to you by the Association of Independent Colleges and Universities of Pennsylvania and Misericordia University. Join us next time for another exciting, scintillating discussion, and we will uh, look forward to being with you then. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm.